I am delighted to be joined with my colleagues to call on President-elect Trump to change course dramatically. His campaign conduct and Electoral College victory have unleashed a wave of verbal and physical assaults against our fellow Americans. In just the last six days, the Southern Poverty Law Center has documented hundreds of acts of discrimination and violence toward many of the ethnic and social groups that he attacked in his campaign. Schools and college campuses vandalized with terrible, racist, Islamophobic, and sexist graffiti, students being taunted and bullied by classmates, public and private spaces defiled with messages of hate. These attacks are absolutely unacceptable. We condemn them, and we stand united with our fellow Americans. Unfortunately, these acts of hate have been enabled by President-elect Trump's campaign strategy of promoting bigotry, racism, and sexism. It is a logical consequence of his attacks and discrimination aimed at Hispanics, African Americans, veterans, immigrants, women, Muslim, Jews, and individuals with disabilities. Millions of Americans see a president-elect who has chosen to knock them down rather than lift them up. His conduct has empowered too many Americans to act on their darkest impulses. This is the wrong vision for America and the wrong path for Donald Trump's administration. We call on him to change course. We urge him as our future president to join us in rejecting hate and embracing respect for every ethnicity, race, and gender. We urge him to join us in fighting for a nation free of discrimination, where every child has the opportunity to thrive and to contribute according to his or her ability. And we urge him to joining us in the fight for our constitutional vision of equality and opportunity for all, and the vision in our Pledge of Allegiance of liberty and justice for all. As he assumes the mantle of leadership in office, it is his responsibility to put an end to the crimes of hate and prejudice sweeping our nation. These wounds to our national <coughs> citizenry are of his making, and it is re his responsibility to rectify the damage. He has the power, as president-elect and as president, to move beyond the hate-filled rhetoric of his campaign. Specifically, we call on president-elect Trump to repudiate the campaign tactics against diverse communities of Americans. We call on President-elect Trump to address the American people and demand that all Americans end their verbal and physical attacks and replace acts of hate with acts of kindness. We call on President-elect Trump to exclude the proponents of discrimination and hatred from the ranks of his administration, and that includes immediately firing Steve Bannon as his chief strategist. It is time for President-elect Trump to act boldly and powerfully to put the nation on a path of healing. For the sake of all of Americans, we call upon him to rise to the challenge. Debbie Stabenow. Well, good afternoon, and first I want to thank Senator Merkley for pulling us together and for uh, authoring a very important letter to the President-elect. You know, people are fearful across the country right now, and it is the president-elect's responsibility. He has the mantle of leadership, and it's important that he put an end to the crimes of hate and prejudice that are touching our schools, our communities across the country. He has the power to move beyond the hate-filled rhetoric of the campaign, and it's absolutely critical that he do that. So we are calling upon him to exclude the discrimination and the, the hatred from the ranks of his administration, and specifically, Donald Trump's appointment of Steve Bannon is the absolute wrong message to send to Americans today. This is someone who has expressed racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, anti-LGBT sentiments, and on and on and on. This is someone whose views do not belong in the White House, in the House own, occupied by the President of the United States in our great country. It's time for the country to heal. It's time to bring people together. And the President-elect has that responsibility to lead to do that. Now, 
I want to be clear. If President-elect Trump wants to work with us on creating jobs for people in Michigan and across the country, on fulfilling what he talked about with fair trade and infrastructure jobs and opportunities for citizens to get better jobs and improve their lives, count me in. But if he's going to continue with the kind of appointments that Steve Bannon represent, represent and not step up to provide leadership at this incredibly important time, count me out. Thanks very much. Good afternoon and aloha, everyone. I represent the state of Hawaii, one of the most racially and culturally diverse states in the entire country. And since the election, I've said that we should judge the president-elect by his actions and decisions. <coughs> Presidents send clear messages about their intentions uh, by who they appoint to senior positions. And the appointment of Steve Bannon is a pretty clear message to us. What Steve Bannon believes is not a mystery. He has demeaned women, advocated for white supremacy, and promoted anti-Semitism. Breitbart, his website has said so many offensive things. In addition to saying that immigrants spread disease, it has also advocated a religious test for immigration. As an immigrant and a religious minority, this isn't a test that I would have passed. Quite frankly, it's sad that we are having a debate about whether a white supremacist should serve as a senior counselor to the president-elect. So as I said, you know, who the president surrounds himself really is a message. And um, there have been over, as mentioned, over 300 reports now of hateful harassment, intimidation of minority groups since Election Day. And is hate speech? Harassment, intimidation, the new norm in our country. Are these statements and behaviors acceptable in this country? They are not. When asked by 60 Minutes about those reports, I'm glad that, that the president-elect said, quote, I hate to hear that and stop it. That's what he said. However, he is sending the exact opposite message by appointing someone like Steve Bannon, a white supremacist, to such an important White House position. We cannot allow Mr. Bannon's statements and beliefs to become the norm in this country. I join my colleagues here and others to call on the President to withdraw his job offer to Steve Bannon. Ed Markey. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Maisie. Uh, thank uh, Jeff Merkley, Chris Van Hollen, uh, Debbie Stabenow, but so many other people uh, in the Senate, but around the country, who are very upset with this moment that we are in uh, today in the United States of America. Because there is no place in our society, let alone the White House, for purveyors of hate and violence against any group of Americans. Steve Bannon has fueled the rhetoric and the activities of hate groups that actively promote violence against immigrants. Muslims, women, African Americans, the LGBTQ community, and people of the Jewish faith. For years, through the Breitbart website, Steve Bannon and his so-called alt-right movement have chosen to champion the positions of neo-Nazis, white nationalists, and anti-Semites. Donald Trump needs to banish the Bannons of this world from his administration. The alt-right is all wrong for America. President-elect Trump will forever poison the well with Congress and the American people by appointing figures like Steve Bannon, whose stock and trade is hate and violence against the American people. As he starts his transition to his new administration, Donald Trump is sending the wrong signal to every single American, to every immigrant working for their American dream, to every little girl hoping to shatter the glass ceiling, to every black person, Muslim or LGBTQ individual <clears throat> looking to the federal government to live up to the fundamental tenet that all people are created equal. The kind of hate 
brandished by Steve Bannon and others like him, is not who America is. Not now, not ever. If Donald Trump wants to keep his word and unify the country, he must call on all of his appointments to repudiate any and all past affiliations with hate groups. And Donald Trump himself must denounce anyone who has affiliations with groups who perpetrate hate and violence against the American people. We are in an epic, historic battle for our democracy. The stand we take today will determine if future generations live in a nation founded on hope of, of a nation uh, that uh, can provide opportunities for everyone, or is it a nation that tolerates hate as something that is an everyday part of our existence? Today and every day moving forward, we must always be guided by the principles and values of our nation, justice, tolerance, liberty, and equality for all races, creeds, colors, faiths, and all uh, countries of origin. The most powerful message Donald Trump can send to the American people right now is to stand firmly on the side of these time-honored values. The first step is to rescind Steve Bannon's appointment and commit to an appointment process that celebrates the best of America and not the worst. Now let me turn and recognize uh, Chris Van Hollen, thank our you, newest thank, thank uh, senator thank from thank the state you, of Maryland. Thank you, Ed Markey. Uh, th thank, you, um, thank you, Ed, and thank you uh, to Jeff Merkley for bringing us together. It's uh, great to have an opportunity to be with my uh, future uh, colleagues here. And I think we all agree that where we can find a common ground uh, with the president-elect in terms of creating jobs, uh, modernizing our infrastructure so we have a 21st century infrastructure, uh, we're prepared to work together. But when it comes to trying to turn back the clock on the march toward social justice in America, on the march toward building a more perfect union, we will fight them to the very end. There is no going back. There is no turning back the clock. Now, the president-elect just came through an incredibly divisive, ugly campaign uh, where the rhetoric and the tools he used were to divide America against one another. So there was some relief in the country when, in his first statement, he said he wanted to be the president uh, for all Americans. But there's a big difference between words and actions. We were all taught uh, growing up that actions speak louder than words. It's easy to look at a TV camera and tell people to stop the hate. But when you say that and look at the TV camera and then the next moment, the action you take is to appoint Steve Bannon, who has a history of ugliness and division and bigotry through the platform that he had in the alt-right, then you're sending a very different and stronger message in the opposite direction. So we all need, Americans need to measure these words by the deeds that follow. And if you look at the deed appointing Steve Bannon to one of the highest positions in the country in the White House, if you look at that deed, then the words look hollow. So we're here to tell the, and ask the Vice President-elect to take another deed that actually reassures the country that he meant what he said when he said he wanted to be president for all Americans. And the way you do that is to rescind that decision. We're absolutely delighted, Chris, that you could join us for your, uh, your first semi-official, not you. quite a senator, but definitely <laughs> senator-elect, and, and your words were so well spoken. Are there any uh, questions that folks might have? Yes. Um, senator, Republicans here on Capitol Hill say that they're taking a wait-and-see approach because the president-elect has the right to assemble the team that he chooses. Uh, do you have any indication that Steve Bannon might perhaps moderate some of these views once he's actually in the White House? Uh, there's no indication of such moderation. And indeed, we have uh, two sets of records. We have his record uh, hosting Breitbart and all of the uh, hate-filled material uh, that he cultivated. And as former staff have indicated, it was his goal to provide a, a platform that, for this type of material. They're very supportive of it. And second, 
We have him as a campaign strategist uh, for the president, encouraging the strategies that uh, now, uh, well, at that point, candidate Trump utilized. Uh, and so uh, this is a, a terrible record, and it's a absolutely terrible message. When this very moment when all of us have fielded uh, so many phone calls and contacts from our constituents and our various states, uh, people who are in tears uh, over knowing that an, an individual who had attacked them so vociferously during the campaign is going to be our president. And then to see him appoint an individual who was a campaign strategist for that approach and is now going to be the chief strategist for the president in the White House. Uh, so there is no space. Uh, I call upon my Republican uh, colleagues to recognize uh, that this uh, appointment is uh, a, not only uh, offensive throughout America and further deepening the divides and the, and the damage, but is really an unwise approach for the president a, as well. And I urge them to join us in calling uh, for this uh, uh, appointment to be withdrawn. Yes, sir. Would anybody else want to an answer? Nope. Well, so obviously the president has power to pick his mm -hmm. um, staff. You guys have a lot more power when it comes to uh, cabinet appointments. I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of some of the names being bandied about that have their own controversial history on race, especially you know, your colleague, uh, Senator Sessions, as well as Chris Kobach. I'll see if anybody would like to comment on, on that. Well, to the extent that some of these um, nominations may come to committees such as a Judiciary Committee on which I served and as well as other relevant committees, uh, there will be ample opportunity for those kinds of, um, that kind of information to come forward. And all of those appointments have to go through a security clearance, uh, as I think uh, anybody who's working in the White House has to go through a security clearance. Uh, I would say that that kind of uh, uh, security clearance information should be made public. Um. Ronald Reagan named James Watt as the Secretary of Interior. It was a very controversial appointment at the time. Uh, I actually conducted an investigation of an undersale of coal at the Powder River Basin, uh, which led to President Reagan actually convening a special panel to investigate that. Uh, James Watt's response to Ronald Reagan convening a panel was, oh, look at the composition of that panel. Two women, a black, a Jew, and a cripple. James Watt was gone the next day. That's what we expect from the Trump administration. We expect a president who is not going to tolerate the kind of language uh, which puts fear into the hearts of tens of millions of Americans. Ronald Reagan responded to that challenge in 1983. Donald Trump has to respond to this challenge today. And the same thing is true for any of his cabinet appointees without addressing any one of them individually. There is a high standard that has to be established uh, in our country with regard to what the responsibility is of a, an appointed cabinet official uh, to respect each and every American. Um, this is for anybody who wants to answer it. Um, following on Nancy's question, why do you think more Republicans have not come out and criticized Steve Bannon, and have you heard anything differently in private that your Republican yeah. colleagues are bringing up about? <laughs> uh, I'll simply note that uh, senators have been distributed to the four winds uh, following the, the election, and they're just now descending upon D.C. So if you ask me that question or ask us that question in a week, I might have uh, more to, to say on it. But I haven't heard directly from my Republican colleagues at this point. Did anyone want to follow up on that? Okay. Senator, is this something that you intend to bring up with those Republican colleagues now that they're back? Uh, yes, I, I certainly do intend to do so. And uh, I hope we will, we will hear from them and have them join our call. I have a feeling that many of them may choose to contact the Trump team, transition team, uh, a little more quietly than we are, than the conversation that we're carrying on publicly today. 
uh, but uh, in whatever form they wish to register uh, their, their sense that this is an uh, extraordinarily inappropriate, uh, misguided appointment, uh, I certainly would welcome uh, their voice in that, in that conversation. I wanted to follow up on Senator Van Hollen's comment about areas where you may be able to work together um, and how do you talk a little bit more about what those might be and then the impact of having to potentially work with Steve Bannon if he's still in that position. Well, I'm ha happy to elaborate on that. I think uh, we all saw that the night of the election, the one issue uh, that Donald Trump, President-elect Trump, decided to talk about was modernizing our infrastructure, which is something that I dare say all of us uh, standing here had been pushing for for years. And many of us have put forward very specific proposals to modernize our infrastructure for the 21st century. In fact, it's been uh, some of our Republican colleagues on the Hill uh, who have been unwilling to commit the resources uh, necessary. So that's an area uh, where we would look to try to find uh, common ground. But make no mistake, uh, to the extent that uh, there are these other efforts uh, to roll back the progress we've made towards social justice, as I said and as we're all saying, they will get the fight of their lives because we're not uh, going to turn back the clock uh, in America. I'd like to add that Speaker Ryan has already put forward uh, various uh, indications and proposals relating to privatizing Medicare and Social Security. And to the extent that uh, President-elect Trump has said that he would keep Social Security strong, uh, that is uh, definitely an area that I hope that he uh, can work with us on. President-elect Trump uh, campaigned as a champion for working Americans. Uh, as I look back over his biography, his life, I haven't seen someone, I don't see somebody who woke up a single day thinking or fighting for working Americans. I doubt that that will be at the top of his list now, but I hope it is. I hope he proves me wrong. And I think, as my colleagues have stated, we are ready to work hard on infrastructure. We're work ready to work hard on creating living wage jobs and there may be substantial other areas that we can we can work together. Uh, do you regret willing to fill up the threshold for presidential appointees? Uh, no, I don't regret that at all. Uh, if you turn the clock back to November 2013, we had a situation where the court positions were being hijacked. As you might recall, there were three D.C. Circuit Court positions that the Republicans said, we are not going to allow this president to fill those positions. We're not going to allow that to happen, and uh, we're not going to allow the president go forward to have a, a clear vote on uh, his uh, nominee for the Environmental Protection Agency or for the Labor Department or for the National Labor Relations Board, and the list goes on and on. And so the uh, confrontation over the abuse of advice and consent was a very important one. And we did lower the threshold uh, to a simple majority in all but the Supreme Court. Why did we not lower it on the Supreme Court? The basic story is this. We recognize that the Supreme Court is of profound importance. Its integrity is of profound importance to our nation. And we did not want to encourage a president and a majority in the Senate from the same party to reach to extremes that would further damage the integrity of the court. So we left the supermajority in place on the Supreme Court. Now, what we see now uh, is the hijacking of, of the Supreme Court position and dozens and dozens of circuit court and district court positions that are being taken away from the Obama administration without the ability to hold votes on the floor and being delivered to the Trump administration. This is going to severely damage the integrity of our court system. And I call again upon our, our colleagues, our Republican colleagues, let's hold up and down votes on these nominees uh, so that the, we, the tradition in our country of enabling a president uh, to, to put forward their person and force us to vote, if you will, on whether that person is a fit character or unfit character, which is how Hamilton characterized the responsibility of advice and consent for the Senate to decide a fit character or unfit character. And that would be an important guide for the, for the future. Last question. Senator, Senator Hartley, but you wrote in a fundraising email before the election for the PCCC referencing Republican blockade of the Supreme Court on the he said, Democrats need to take back the majority, and if we do, it's time to continue what we started on filibuster reform, seemingly arguing that the filibuster threshold be lowered to the Supreme Court. Do you no longer hold that? 
Uh, actually, I have sp very specific proposals I've put forward, and they do not include lowering the, uh, the threshold on Supreme Court nominees. What I have argued is that the, uh, the filibuster on Supreme Court nominees should be a talking filibuster, so it is of great, takes great effort and great attention uh, for uh, senators in the, in the minority to, if you will, obstruct a nominee. I've also argued that we should have the ability for all senators, minority and majority, to put forward relevant amendments on the floor of the Senate so we can have real debate on real issues and by doing so in exchange only have the filibuster on final passage, not on the procedural motions, not on the amendments. So I'm referring there to specific proposals I put forward, which I think are great proposals whether you're minority or the majority. And I think with that, thank you all thank you. very much and thank you so much to my colleagues. Yes, sir.